How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. And to the newest Pokemon games coming out, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. It's so exciting to have a new remake in our hands, since we haven't had a traditional one since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire in 2014, and I'm ready to get into a new monotype hardcore Nuzlocke by going through Brilliant Diamond using only water types. This run's gonna be mostly off the cuff, since we don't exactly have all of the resources for the game on release, but I think it's gonna be at least manageable. After all, it's a remake, it shouldn't be too different. Especially since they said that they were gonna be relatively faithful remakes, right? Right? Well, uh, let's find out. If you don't know the rules to these runs, they are on screen, and while you read those, let me give you a quick reminder to make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, Give this video a like, I'd love to see this video hit 4,000 likes for a brand new Pokemon game, and check out my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash chaoticmeatballtv, where I'll be starting the Professor Oak's Challenge of Brilliant Diamond, and giving away a copy of both Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl tonight on stream. Link on screen and in the description. I'd love to see a ton of you guys there. But before we get into the run, there's quite a few things in the beginning that are just filler and boring, so why not talk about today's sponsor, Ridge Wallets. Now, I've talked about Ridge before, but let me give you a reminder as to why you should be picking one of these wallets up. The Ridge Wallet is the most compact and durable wallet you can find, with RFID blocking technology to protect your card's information from unwanted digital pickpockets and holds up to 12 cards, including room for cash, so those gift cards that you get for your birthday or Christmas will fit in there perfectly. There's also over 30 different colors for you to choose from, and I've gotten the white, black, and blue wallets, and the people that I've gifted them to have extremely enjoyed them, and I also enjoy the white one that I use on the regular. And since they're backed by over 40,000 five-star reviews, 40,000, the team over at Ridge is so confident that you'll like it that you can take the wallet for a test run, a whole 45 days, so you can send it back to get a full refund if you don't love it. Now, I've got a better deal for you this time. You can get your own wallet or get one as a gift for a friend or family member by going down into the description, using my link and the coupon code MEATBALL to get 15% off your order until December 7th. After that, it'll return back down to 10% off, so you'll want to act fast. Thank you so much to Ridge for sponsoring this video, and let's get into the run. So, of course, with water types, we're going to want to choose Piplup as our starter. Having a water steel type is going to be great advantage later on in the game, and with the ability to use powerful flying type attacks as a tertiary strategy, like Pluck and Drill Peck later on, we should be in good hands. After taking out the Starly, I'm able to do the preliminary stuff like head through Route 201, grabbing 10 potions from this fellow here, before meeting with Professor Rowan and nicknaming my Piplup Plupil. Fun fact, that was the beta name for Piplup before they finalized everything. Pretty funny sounding, all things considered. With that out of the way, I'm able to buy some Pokeballs and head through Route 202 for the first few trainer fights, and into Jubilife City. There's a few battles we can do here, but I want to get a few new encounters first. Firstly, I can head back to Route 201 to grab Bidoof, and while we can't use him until it evolves, that'll be level 15, and since the level cap for Rorik is 14, it will not take too long. I nickname her Beaturf because I think that's funny, but that's not all. To the left of Jubilife City is a man who will give us the old rod, and I can capture Magikarp out on Route 218. Not the most usable thing either, but I nickname her Flip Flop, and there is one more encounter I can get now, and it is usable. The Ravaged Path is the earliest home for Psyduck, which does take quite a while to find since it's a 2% encounter like the original Diamond and Pearl, but I'm able to find it within the hour, putting our team up to 4 members. I nickname her Wavecrest, and now it's time to prep for the first rival battle, which almost resulted in a premature death of the run. See, the two trainers in the trainer school that normally give you TM10 hidden power in Diamond and Pearl now have Charge Beam on their Abros, which is extremely dangerous this early on with only water types. But fortunately for me, I don't lose any of my Pokemon in the process, receiving three copies of TM10, but instead of it being hidden power, it's workup. These might come in handy in the future, but for now I just deliver the town map to Mary and train up Piplup and Psyduck so that they can take care of his team. Before that though, I grab the Poketch, which is a bit weird to use without a touchscreen, but at least I don't have to mess with it at all during the run. 
To the right of Jubilife is Route 203, where the first rival battle resides against Barry, and it shouldn't be too hard. He leads off with Starly at level 7, so I go with Psyduck, two-shotting it with Water Gun before Turtwig comes out. I'm afraid it might have a Grass-type move now that Piplup learned Water Gun at level 6, but I'm not really afraid of it, and I don't really see it since I blow him out with Confusion, swapping to Piplup once Turtwig was in the red to finish him off with a few Water Guns, winning the fight. Sweet, that wasn't too bad at all, nor were any of the trainers on Route 203, or in the Orberg Gate, Mine, and Gym. They're all just experience fodder for my Pokemon to get to the level cap of 14, ready and prepared to take on Rourke. The only thing I'm remotely worried about here is the potential change of movesets, as well as Sturdy now being in its post-Gen 5 iteration, where you can't one-shot Pokemon with said ability. But I have water types, I probably shouldn't be. Rourke leads off with a level 12 Geodude who doesn't have Sturdy as the newly learned Water Pulse from Psyduck one-shots it, leading to Onyx. This does have Sturdy, but it doesn't really matter as he sets up Stealth Rocks, using a Potion next turn. This doesn't fully heal Onyx though, so another Water Pulse is plenty enough to bring him down to Granados. Psyduck gets outsped by it, but it only goes for Leer, so I just one-shot it with Water Pulse, winning the fight. Well, I suppose that went about as well as it should have, given that I had the massive type advantage. Coal badge in hand, one down, seven to go. I made the quick trip back to Jubilife, taking out the rocket grunts and going north into Floroma Town, grabbing myself a Jirachi and Mew because why the heck are these so early on in the game? Literally, just make them post-game only. I threw them into the box and continued with the story. Piplup evolved on the grunts in the Floroma Meadows, and boy howdy, this is reminding me that this is going to be the worst part of the Professor Oak's challenge. See these? These are honey trees. Yeah, I don't really have to say anything more. At least I've got my shiny only Let's Go Oak challenge to work on while waiting on those six hour intervals. Link in the description. Valley Windworks is my next stop, home of two new encounters, but I can only get one. Fortunately for me, that encounter is Shellos. I nickname it Gloopy, and we're gonna have access to quite the number of electric type counters in this, since eventually we're also gonna have Barboach and Wooper, so I'm definitely sitting pretty. After taking out the Magma Grunts inside of the Windworks, I figured it would make sense to catch Bidoof up, as well as Shellos and Magikarp, up to Psyduck and Primplup's level, training them in the Orberg Mine until Bidoof evolved into Babarel, as the EXP share is a permanent mechanic in the game, rather than being a toggleable item, which makes this both a bit easier and a bit more difficult when it comes to trying to stay under the level cap. You'll see why soon. After getting everyone to level 16, I'm feeling more comfortable with Mars and her Perugly, especially because Shellos already knows we recover and can easily stave it off if needed. She leads off with Zubat, so I just go for Psyduck, destroying it in two water pulses after confusing it off the first one, making it hit itself and get through damage list going into Perugly. I figured I'd swap into Primplup since this is 100% a fake out turn, giving me a free switch and letting me use Charm a few times to make this big cat a non-threat. Sending in Shellos once Prinplup got to a low amount of HP, then ripping through it with four water pulses, mixing it up recover to ensure that a critical wouldn't destroy me, winning the fight and clearing out Team Aqua from the Valley Windworks. We won't have to deal with them again for a little while, so for now it's just a hop into Route 205, housing Buizel as my encounter, and a skip through Eterna Forest which, hilariously enough, is somewhat broken by omnidirectional movement, as I can just evade every double battle here, getting through without a care in the world, and getting into Eterna City. I figured I'd try going straight into the gym since I was getting close to the level cap, but turns out I'm gonna need an extra level or two and get closer since the barrel was almost defeated by one of the trainers in here. So I do a wee bit of grinding, evolving my Magikarp into the water flying type Gyarados, and edging my team through level 22, making them as ready as I can be for Gardenia. She's likely going to be the hardest obstacle in the run, so I'm gonna have to be careful. She leads off with a Cherubi at level 19, so this isn't really too threatening. I just start with the barrel, heal locking it after the first headbutt and KOing after two more, leading to Turtwig. I figured if a level 19 Cherubi couldn't take the barrel under half with one move, that Turtwig's Grass Knot shouldn't be able to either, and I'm correct, as it takes the barrel down to 10 HP, 20 after the Orinberry, after getting nailed with a headbutt, and since I have speed, I KO with a second and leave her with just her level 22 Roserade. Weirdly enough, they made this thing more of a physical attacker with Petal Blizzard in this generation, so I swapped into Gyarados for the Intimidate drop, getting hit with a Grass Knot for slightly under half. 
The second connects after she outspeeds, bringing Gyarados to just 1 HP after I hit a light bite. And this is where I figured I was screwed. I swapped into Boizel to test the waters, no pun intended, and since I'm afraid... This thing can just sweep my team if I'm not careful, and sure enough, a grass not one-shots, taking out my at least most expendable member. While I know Primplup's defenses are relatively good for now, so I swapped, went for Pluck to get rid of her Citrus Berry, barely surviving a Grass Knot. This brings her down into the red, so I figured there was now or never for getting another Intimidate drop, so I swap, hoping that she heals this turn, but she doesn't, using Petal Blizzard to KO Gyarados and leave me with only four more team members. Minus two attack does put me in a good position though, so I swap into Shellos, taking a Petal Blizzard for under half as a single Water Pulse is able to put her down from red HP range into the KO, finishing the fight and giving me the Forest Badge. It's so sad that Gyarados died of Ligma so early in the run. That was probably my one-way ticket to victory, but sacrifices must be made in order to carry on. I should be fine anyway, we'll get Wingle to replace the typing soon enough. Before I'm allowed to leave though, I'm forced to do two things. Firstly is take out Team Plasma over in the Eterna headquarters, so I squash all of the grunts before meeting Jupiter at the top. I don't really have to train to prepare for her, I just slapped some Pecha and Orin berries on my Pokemon and went to work. She leads with Zubat, so I went for Bubble Beam, barely missing the KO as she confuses me, so I swapped from Primplup to Babarel, taking a light Poison Fang that gets the Toxic Poison effect off, but the Pecha Berry is able to negate it letting me KO with a headbutt and leaving just Skun Tank. I've got Yawn on the barrel now, so I should be able to just put it to sleep and nail it with a few headbutts to KO, which does work, though getting poisoned by poison gas and not realizing that this thing has aftermath almost cost me my barrel, but it does manage to survive another day. I really need to get better at my memorization of abilities for Pokemon games. Some things like aftermath I just don't remember until it's too late. Though, now I do remember that Sinnoh has quite a few Pokemon with it, like Drifblim, so I'll keep my eyes out for it for now. The last thing I'm forced to do is go into the Grand Underground, and this is where I divulged a little bit of my attention for about two hours, since I started finding statues of Water-type Pokemon, thinking that I could encounter these exact Pokemon if I put these statues up in my secret base. Unfortunately, that is not how that works. They just boost the frequency of whenever you'll see a certain type. In my case, I wanted water types. This was some of the data I was able to find about the area, though, and here I was hoping that I'd be able to use this place like the wild area in Sword and Shield, limiting my encounters to one per badge and using unique things like Lantern, Dugong, Swampert, Cronon, these Pokemon that aren't in the Sinnoh decks, but unfortunately, you can't get any of those Pokemon until you get the National decks something that can't be done until the post-game. This place does house early encounters for other types, but for the water type, there's no reason for me to be here. However, if you do want to see a type that utilizes this place a little bit more, check out my poison type only hardcore Nuzlocke and Brilliant Diamond over on the Beast Coast Pokemon channel. I recently signed with them, and it would mean a lot if you guys went over there, subscribed, and checked out the variety of Pokemon content we'll be making over there. Challenges, TCG, VGC, Unite, among others. Link is also on screen and in the description. Anyway, there aren't any hard battles between Cycling Road and Heart Home City, though we get to meet the leader of Team Flare in Mount Coronet before heading onward. Now, there's a bit of a dilemma that I'm sitting with for this section, as we have to skip Fantina due to her being the fifth gym leader in Diamond and Pearl rather than the third, like Platinum, but both Maylene and Crasher Wake have the same level cap meaning I'm going to have to go into one of those battles underleveled. Since I have the resistance against Crash Awake, it makes sense for me to go after him first, but me going after him first entails me risking more deaths due to more high-level trainers and accidental overages of EXP. With that problem established, though, Barry's here for another fight before I'm able to leave Heart Home, but I'm not too close to the level cap yet, so I should be fine. He leads off with Starly as I go with Shellos, ripping through it with a single Water Pulse after Barry tries the classic Double Team Please Oh Lord Don't Die strategy, which fails. Second out is Grottle, and boy howdy I need to lower this thing's accuracy pronto since it has Curse. I figured I'd go for one Mud Slap and then attempt Body Slam for, for the Paralysis, but the latter doesn't work as Grottle leaves Shellos nearly dead at the hands of a Razor Leaf. I swap out for Primplup, dodging a Razor Leaf while coming in and using Charm to counteract his Curse. A second charm basically makes Razor Leaf useless, so it just starts going ham with Stealth Rock and Curse for some reason. Losing Grottle after a few plucks takes it down. 
Third out is Weasel, and this thing isn't a threat at all, so I just charm it a few times, swap for Babarel, put it to sleep with Yawn, swap to Psyduck, then begin to set up with Calm Mind, a TM that I managed to find in the Grand Underground. If you guys watch the Legendary Speedrun series, you know how broken Calm Mind is, and it does not change here. I managed to set up a few and absolutely annihilate both Weasel and Ponyta with Confusion and Water Pulse respectively, winning the fight. Calm Mind really should be a help for taking out both Wake and Maylene, since the resistance on the former, as well as the super effective confusion on the latter, will help immensely. Speaking of super effective, in Veilstone City's department store, there's TMs. Lots and lots of good ones. Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, Flamethrower, Protect, Light Screen, Reflect, Psychic, Dazzling Gleam, Blizzard, Thunder, Focus Blast. There's a ton of stuff here that will help me rip through the remainder of this game, because the game corner no longer exists so they just put all the TMs in here. I grabbed a good number of Ice Beam TMs since it's great for handling pesky grass and flying types with numerous party members, and Psychic makes the Calm Mind strategy way better than it would have been with just Confusion, giving Psyduck double the power behind it. Not to mention, the trainers in this game give so much money that this isn't even hurting my wallet. Plus, these TMs only cost a few thousand apiece, nothing in comparison to trying to get these in the since-closed game corner. Anyway, with all of that excitement out of the way, it's a quick trek through routes 214 and 213, grabbing Wingle on the way into the Pastoria City Gym, naming it Pico because I'm completely unoriginal. The trainers don't really stand a chance in here, and at level 28, I should be pretty much fine. I also taught the barrel both Grass Knot and Thunderbolt in preparation, since this leader should be a lot easier with said moves in tow. Wake leads off with Gyarados, so I go with the Barrel, hitting a Thunderbolt to bring it into red HP, heal locking him after he lands Crunch. A Super Potion is just not enough to heal Gyarados at a KO range of Thunderbolt though, giving me more fuel for Floatzel later on. Second out is Quagsire, and I almost read that off the script as Quagmire. Been watching too much Family Guy, I suppose. Grass Knot nearly gets the one-shot, but Quagsire hangs on close to 1 HP as Mudshot lands, lowering the Barrel's speed and putting him in range of a KO. So I swap here as to not risk getting outsped, going into Printplup as he heals with a Super Potion. It's quite weird, it's almost like the AI will choose to heal sometimes, and other times they'll choose to see the KO and just go for it, almost like an actual person trying to outpredict the person in front of them. It's kinda neat. However, Ice Beam and a Rain Boosted Bubble Beam is plenty enough to take out Quagsire post Super Potion, leaving just Floatzel. After using Charm a few times though, this one's got no chance, letting me pluck his Citrus Berry and wail on him a few times until Printlup goes below half health, putting it in range of Brine, so I swap into Psyduck, nailing a Psychic to KO and win the match. Sadly, this puts Printlup dangerously close to overleveling, so I'll have to deposit it as well as the barrel for this gym, but that's fine, Pelipper and Psyduck should be plenty enough to take on the trainers in here before I can withdraw them and go into the fight full force. I figured I'd mention these between fights that I found a good few Arceus plates in the Grand Underground, getting the Zap plate for Barrel's Thunderbolt, a Splash plate for basically anything on the team, and a Mind plate for Psyduck Psychic, as well as getting a Shell Bell since the leftovers aren't available anywhere during the main game, though that was on the Overworld, I just looked for it in the regular Diamond and Pearl walkthrough, and sure enough it was in the same place. Anyway, let's take down Maylene. She leads off with a Metatite that has bulk up, so leading with Printplup with Charm was my best bet, using it three times to keep her off of high damage, then swapping for Babarel as she uses Flash to get off a Yawn. Even with such deprived stats though, Drain Punch nearly KO'd Babarel, so I'm glad that she only went for Flash on the turn I decided to swap. I swapped again next turn to Psyduck, absorbing a Drain Punch like a champ and spamming Calm Mind a few times while Metatite was asleep. Once Light Screen wore off, I just went for Psychic, KOing both Metatite and her second Pokemon Machoke in one shot as Lucario came in last, outspeeding and using Screech, but it also goes down to a single Psychic as well, winning me the fight. Well, that was certainly not a close fight, but it was a close match with the level cap. Seriously, Game Freak, Ilka, whoever was responsible for this, should have made the EXP share a held item like in Gen 4 if they wanted to be truly faithful, but make it at least toggleable like it was in Gen 6 and 7, it would have made this a much less painful operation. With half of the badges in hand, I figured it's about time I go back and get another encounter to fill out the last slot of my team. 
Route 209 is the home of the Good Rod, as well as the only new encounter here in Goldeen. And while it's not crazy good, it's a physical attacker and will be fully evolved before having to fight Fantina, so it shouldn't be terrible. I also went back through all of the routes where I had skipped trainers due to the level cap for last area, as well as the Lost Tower, so that I could gain access to strength outside of battle, getting everything except for Goldeen up to level 32, since there's another fight with Barry now that I have four badges. He interrupts my chase of this team Skull Grunt, which could have been deadly, but fortunately I'm competent enough to take care of him quickly. He leads off with S Starly? Don't know why this isn't a Staravia yet, but that's fine. Ice Beam KOs it immediately, leading to Buizel. Fly does great work here too, bringing it down to red HP, landing a Swift before I land a Water Pulse to finish it off. Third out is Grottle, and since I'm still in with Pelipper, Ice Beam's an easy two shot for this thing, leaving just Ponyta to fall to Water Pulse, winning me the fight. Feels good to be soloing battles like this, though it won't last for long. After all, these unevolved Pokemon only stick around for a little while longer. I chase down the Grunt, take him out, and get the secret medicine from Cynthia. Yeah, I guess they figured that secret potion was confusing to the new kids. Makes sense, I suppose, with potions being a normal healing item. And after scaring them off, I can head towards Celestic Town, stopping on Route 215 to capture a Barboach by using the Good Rod. I nicknamed it Kairu Shin, Kind of reminds me of the new support that we're getting in Battle of Chaos. Anyway, I dropped off an old charm in exchange for the TMs for Surf, meeting Cyrus once again before challenging Fantina for the Relic Badge. This does take a wee bit of grinding, and since I stopped over on Route 212, I figured I'd also grab myself a Wooper for my encounter, naming it MBT. Yeah, that looks pretty accurate. <laughs> Anyway, skipping ahead, I evolved Prinplup into Empoleon, and I think I'm ready for Fantina. She leads off with Drift Blimp, so I go for Pelipper, and since I made it hold a Rost Berry before the fight began, I managed to get past this thing scot-free, KOing with two Ice Beams and forcing it into wasting its time with two Will-O-Wisps, leading into Gengar. I figured I'd try going for Surf, which lands after she confuses me, barely missing the one-shot, but next turn Pelipper hits itself as she heals with a Hyper Potion. Sludge bombing Pelipper down to red HP next turn, so I'm forced to swap. I'm expecting another one, so I went into the newly steel type Empoleon, but she heals with a second Hyper Potion. Didn't expect her to have that, but that's fine, as the person berry I gave Empoleon heals it from Confuse Ray as I go for Surf, taking her back down into the red as next turn, Confuse Ray is avoided, going down to Ice Beam due to her Curse Body having disabled Surf the previous turn. Last out is Miss Magius, and that shouldn't be too hard to take out. She uses Confuse Ray, outspeeding, but Empoleon's able to break through for the turn, hitting Ice Beam for about a third before it just turns into a war of attrition. She can't hurt me much, Magical Leaf can't hit hard, her ghost moves are resisted, so I just keep clicking on Ice Beam until Surf is enabled again, letting me hit two of those when they're eventually enabled to KO and win the fight. Alright, well, that wasn't too terribly hard, a little boring, but hey, we should have some more fun fights coming up here soon. Candleave City is pretty accessible as soon as I'm done with Fantina, so I just flew over to Pastoria City and used a bunch of my heart skills that I got from the Grand Underground. I'm able to give things like Air Slash to Pelipper over Fly, among a few other moves, before training a bit on those new Surf routes, one of which is Route 219, the home of Tentacruel, which I made sure to repel trick out since I didn't exactly feel like training it up for the rest of my team, and Poison should be a great subtype for taking on the Fairy type, and having another way to take care of grass types, especially the Snover line, since we're getting close to Candace. Once those routes are cleared out, it's time once again to fight Barry in Canalave, since I can't access the gym without taking him on first. He leads off with Staravia, about time, as I go with Pelipper. One-shotting it with Ice Beam after he outspeeds and uses Endeavor for minimal damage, going into Ponyta's second. It just wastes a turn for agility, so it goes down to Surf, as does Buizel's Air Slash. Heracross is out fourth, so I just go for the Air Slash again, taking an Aerial Lace before he goes into his last Pokemon, Grottle. Air Slash misses the first time as he goes for Leech Seed, but I'm able to land a combined three Air Slashes and Ice Beams in a row to take him out as he wastes time with Stealth Rock, winning the fight in short order. Barry's definitely getting weaker and weaker compared to me as we go, but now I'm in a bit of a trap. My Pokemon are getting a bit too close to the level cap, but once I started making my way through the trainers, fortunately nothing went over as I made it to Byron. Sorry bud, like father like son, and that son's already dead. 
Byron leads with Bronzor, so I go with Empoleon, using Surf twice to take it down as it wastes time with Trick Room and Sandstorm, boosting my own special defense in the process since Empoleon's also Steel type as it goes down. Steelix is out second, and Surf brings it down to 1 HP, but thanks to Trick Room, he's able to land a powerful Earthquake to nearly bring down Empoleon. So I swapped out into Gastrodon, taking less than half from an Earthquake as he heals on the following turn, going back down to 1 HP from Surf as Trick Room ended. So Surf KOs next turn from Gastrodon, leaving just Bastiodon. Sure enough, after using Recover, I'm able to nail two Surfs to KO, winning the fight and the Mine Badge. For some reason, I remember this being the Mineral Badge, but that's probably because I'm thinking of Jasmine and she's in this game. Anyway, plot time and plot we must fulfill, as a bomb goes off at Lake Valor. Well, oh, that's awfully violent, but I've got to take care of the three team yell admins, first of which is Saturn over at Lake Valor. He's pretty simple to take down as he leads with Kadabra, setting up Surf and uh, Rain Dance in front of a water type that KOs with two Surfs. Okay, well this leads to Bronzor, who is immediately swamped for Toxicroak. Makes sense, he's trying to abuse Dry Skin to his advantage, but Earth Power is able to take him out next turn as Gastronon outspeeds, leaving again just Bronzor. Two Surfs does it in after Payback does Jack all to Gastrodon, leaving just two more admins to take out. Mars is back over in Lake Verity, and since Dawn is a completely superfluous character, she isn't able to beat her for me, so I have to take care of Mars myself. She leads with Golbat, so I went for Empoleon, taking a U-turn into Bronzor as I went for Ice Beam, getting minimal damage on Bronzor. I was hoping to get enough to Surf and KO with it next turn, but Bronzor survives on basically 1 HP, wasting its only turn on Iron Defense and going down to Surf, leading back to Golbat next turn. It goes for Bite, letting me land an Ice Beam to nearly KO, but next turn it does U-turn again into Perugly, whereas Ice Beam only does a round of 4th on it as it comes in. Perugly lands a critical slash, but so does Empoleon with Surf, taking it out and leaving just the near-dead Golbat to go down to Surf, leaving just one more admin. That admin is locked behind the next gym battle, so after a quick run-through of Mount Coronet in routes 216 and 217, it's time to ask this question. Can this be our final battle in this Nuzlocke? More like Candy's nuts fit in your mouth! Pew, 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 pew. That was really bad. That joke was almost as bad as Flundery's nuts. Anyway, after taking out all of her gym trainers, everything's between level 40 and 42, so I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. She leads off with Snover, so I went Pelipper, which oddly enough gives me some knowledge as Drizzle goes off before Snow Warning, so I know I'm free to go in with Air Slash, Outspeed, and pick up the KO, leading to Metacham. She misses with Rock Slide as I'm able to KO with another Air Slash, two down, two to go, with Sneasel coming out third. It lands Avalanche for around 45% after a Surf landed for massive damage, so I just went for Roost, healing that off, resisting the second Avalanche that wasn't boosted due to an attack not landing on Sneasel, doing barely anything and letting me KO with a second Surf next turn. All that's left is former President Barack Obama Snow, who flinches off of the first Air Slash, going down to the second and winning the fight in short order. Can't complain about that one, Air Slash bringing us to the moon, baby! So I was mistaken, I completely forgot that you don't actually fight Jupiter here. I just scare her back over to the Veilstone HQ so I can complete the full frontal assault on... Wait, what team are we fighting here? Stevie, do you have any idea? Oh yeah, it's team I hope you choke on these galactic-sized nuts. Hmm, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. I don't know why we keep making these jokes today. Anyway, it's a hop and a skip through the grunts before I make it to Cyrus, who has a very underwhelming team for this point in the game. He opens with Murkrow, so I start with Empoleon, Ice Beaming it and shooting it down immediately, leading to Golbat. It barely doesn't go down to Ice Beam, landing a very weak bite of all things, before he heals with a Super Potion. I'm an idiot and don't click on Ice Beam again, instead going for Surf to try to finish it off to conserve power points, but it barely doesn't KO again, leading to another Super Potion, but Surf for the second time manages to KO, leaving just Sneasel, who keeps going for beat up as I KO with a few Metal Claws. Sorry buddy, see you in a few minutes with a semi-real team. Saturn is immediately after, and at least he has more of a real team. First up is Kadabra, going down to Barrel's Crunch, so Toxicroak's out next, and I immediately need to swap into Pelipper, since I'm expecting the fighting move, and that does happen, with Brick Break hitting for next to no damage. Two Air Slashes is enough to down Toxicroak as it lands a Light Thief, stealing my Shell Bell for the battle, 
Not that I really needed it, though, with Toxic hitting before he goes down to the second. Fortunately, I've still got Roost, and his last Pokemon is Bronzor, so I'm able to heal, but then swap after Confuse Ray comes down, going into the barrel and participating in a fun War of Attrition, eventually coming out on top thanks to a few Dread Plate boosted crunches, winning the fight and sending them all packing towards Spear Pillar. This is probably where a big mistake of mine comes into play, though. See, I thought the level cap for Volkner was level 47, not level 49, so I'm diligently trying to keep my party under that, while also making sure I'm able to take on the admins at Spear Pillar at an appropriate level. And with Cyrus having a level 48 ace, you would have thought that I would have caught on and realized, but I'm a bit of an idiot. The double battle against Mars and Jupiter is made pretty easy thanks to Surf, two-shotting both Bronzors as Skuntink and Perugly come in at the same time. This keeps Munchlax alive, but barely, so I just let them both target him, though Skuntank does actually go for Poison Gas, getting it on Pelipper as I go for another Surf. It's not Toxic Poison though, so I don't really care, but swapping into Empoleon seems like the best play here. Barry Staraptor takes care of Perugly with a few close combats, leaving Mars with just Golbat, which we double target with Ice Beam and Thief to take care of it, leaving just Jupiter's Pokemon to fall to a myriad of Ice Beams and Thieves, KOing both Skuntank and Golbat to win. All that's left is Cyrus and Dialga itself, so after getting healed, it's time to take on the boss man himself. This time he starts with his newly evolved Honchkrow, but it doesn't really matter as it misses Air Cutter, going down to two Ice Beams as Gyarados makes its way onto the field. This is a back and forth between Air Slash and Roost against it, as he's nailing crunches and waterfalls over and over again. So eventually I just get tired of it, swapping into Gastrodon and stalling him out a bit with Recover before finally nailing an Ice Beam to put him down. Third out is Weavile, and fortunately for me, it has Dig, a two-turn move that I can abuse with Recover, and then swap into Pelipper to evade it, setting the rain back up as I swap for the barrel, taking an Aerial Ace in the process. I probably should have known that I wasn't going to outspeed to hit Yawn, but Dig is a little bit worrisome, so I swap again into Gastrodon, taking minimal damage from it and just bouncing back and forth between Recover and Surf to eventually KO, leaving just Crobat. Two Ice Beams is able to do it in after it misses his first Air Cutter and lands the second, doing minimal damage before I end the battle. One Dialga beat down later, including a near loss of Empoleon, likely the only member of my team that can stand up to Dialga's Roar of Time, and I'm free from the shackles of the story, with Sunny Shore City and Volkner being the last obstacle between myself, Victory Road, and the Pokemon League. Though, sadly, I'm still under the impression that the level cap is 47 instead of 49, so I put Empoleon in the box for the remainder of this badge, seeing as it grew to level 48 on the Dialga fight, then go out to look for more encounters. Route 222 houses Remoraid, and I tried Mr. Backlot's mansion to see if I could get Meryl, but that wasn't until post-game, so I traveled back to the Grand Underground to see if I could get Meryl there. I didn't have the spreadsheet that I do now when I started this run, so I'm looking down here for nothing, eventually residing my fate into the Great Marsh. Meryl's a 30% encounter while surfing, which I do find, but after throwing a single Safari Ball and it getting three shakes, it breaks out, and runs away on the first turn, effectively booting me out of my only fairy type for the run, and likely my easy key to victory against Cynthia's Spiritomb and Garchomp, but I think I can still manage it as long as I play my cards right. Sadly, during my training, MBT the Quagsire was killed off due to a lack of self-control. OCD took a hold of me once again, wanting to train it and get it on level with the rest of the Pokemon for the fight against Volkner, but it died in the process. This happens quite often in my Nuzlocke, to be honest, and I need to learn to move to lower level locations to ensure that my stuff doesn't get killed and sacrifice some time to do so, but I digress. Getting through the gym was difficult with my accidentally self-imposed level cap, but Volkner himself wasn't actually terribly difficult at level 47. He leads off with Raichu, so I go Gastrodon, getting hit with a critical surf for less than half as I land Earth Power, absorbing Raichu's Shookaberry in the process. I figure going for recover just in case he gets another crit is smart, so I do this twice, but then he inexplicably starts going for charge beam despite it not affecting Gastrodon. He does this twice, letting me effectively get a free KO on Raichu, but Ambipom comes in as his follow-up. Fake Out does decent damage, and Double Hit does a massive job, nearly bringing down Gastrodon as a critical surf one-shots him, leaving just Octillery and Luxray. He goes with the former, so I make a bit of a risky play, going for Recover as he goes for Focus Energy, effectively wasting whatever lead he has as I go for another Recover. He misses Octazooka, letting Gastron get back to full as he misses again next turn, going to under half with Earth Power. 
Then he misses for a third time in a row, letting me finish him off with a second Earth Power. This leaves just Luxray, putting me in a massively good position, as Crunch does under half, and Earth Power gets the one-shot, winning me the fight, the Beacon Dash, and the ability to use Waterfall outside of battle. Speaking of Waterfall, Jasmine gives me three copies of the TM before heading up through Route 223 towards Victory Road, giving me a great move for the likes of the Barrel, Sea King, and Tentacruel. And with a single Victory Road later, it's time for the massive grind. The level cap for the Elite Four is 63, as BDSP maintains the awfully large level difference between the 8th Gym and the Elite Four that was present in the originals, but hey, that just makes the endgame more exciting, right? Too bad it makes it also take longer when it comes to training. Everything is about a level 54 after I finish off the Victory Road, so we've got a 9 level adventure before I can take on the League, but I figured that a 6 level adventure to level 60 would be plenty enough to take on the Rival before, who's about to go in woefully unprepared if I don't take him on with this level advantage. He leads off a star after, so I go with my Pelipper, holding the Sky Plate to boost Air Slash, but I'm mostly leading here because close combat is a problem. For some reason though, his Staraptor has Sunny Day, negating my Drizzle but as Ice Beam nearly one-shots, if not for his Focus Sash. Seriously, Focus Sash before the League? I guess I'm in for a decently hard time. He follows up with a weak Pluck going down to a second Ice Beam and following up with Heracross. Not sure why you'd send this out against the 4 times super effective Flying type, but Rock Slide is a good reason, doing around a quarter as it goes down to Air Slash. Guess that reason wasn't good enough. Third out is the Grass Ground Torterra, which shockingly doesn't go down to a single Ice Beam despite it being quad effective, though it does waste the only turn he's got with Stealth Rock, going down to a second next turn. Half down, half to go, and fourth out is Floatzel, and I'm still in Gen 4 mindset, so I swap into Empoleon expecting it to be a complete wall, but I forgot that Steel no longer resists Dark, though I still just set up Sword Stance, KOing with a single Drill Pack next turn. Empoleon's still sitting at over half health going into Snorlax, so I figured I'd just go for Drill Peck, doing under half as he goes for Yawn, so I figured why not, get one more attack off before swapping out, but Drill Peck gets a critical, KOing and leaving just Rapidash. I figured I'd try brute forcing my way through the sleep to KO Rapidash with Empoleon, but that steel typing does make it a bit more susceptible to Rapidash, so I just swap into Whizcash, finishing him off with a Waterfall to win the fight. Alright, three more levels of grinding later, no edging this time, probably should have done that in hindsight, but I figured it would be a little bit unfair, plus I was getting antsy, and it's time for the League. Leave your predictions down below with how many deaths you expect, and if you think I'll win or not. Now normally I'd like to do a team recap, but my sets are gonna vary between fights since I have so many different TMs. I may as well not waste your time until they come up, otherwise I'd probably be going on for three minutes about potential strategies that might not even come up. With that said, first up is Aaron, and he's actually not too troublesome, as he leads with Dustox, so I go Pelipper, one-shotting with Air Slash and doing the same to Heracross next turn as he lands a Rock Slide for under half. Third out is Beautyfly, who wastes its only turn with Quiver Dance, going down immediately to Air Slash, leaving just Vespiquen and Drapion. He goes with the former, flinching on the first Air Slash, and to conserve power points, I shifted to Ice Beam, finishing her off even after a Citrus Berry. After all, Air Slash is 95% accurate, why risk that when I have a 100% accurate move that can fulfill the same super effective kill the Pokemon purpose? Last out is Drapion, and it's not bug type so it's a little harder to take down, and since the rain stopped, Surf isn't boosted anymore, though it's still a two-shot after Pelipper tanks at Night Slash and Cross Poison to win the fight single-handedly. Well shoot, if I can keep up these one-sided fights, maybe this league won't be too tough after all. Between fights, I decided to give Empoleon Grass Nod, since it takes advantage of its massive special attack, and gives me a clean out to things like Bertha's Whiskash and Quagsire. Speaking of which, she leads with the latter, falling immediately to Grass Knot. Second out is Golem, which Surf connects, but Sturdy is a bit of a prick, letting her survive and knit a nasty earthquake for a near one-shot. Empoleon's done for this battle, so I swap into Bibarel, eating an Earthquake for about 70% on the switch-in, but since I'm faster, I'm able to heal lock her, wasting her a full restore as two waterfalls take her out. Third out is Sudowoodo, and I'm not about to lose another Pokemon to this thing after my Quagsire went down earlier in the run, so I swap into Whizcash, taking a head smash for a little under a third. This isn't too bad, as I can just go for Waterfall, doing well over half, and making her eat the Citrus Berry, leaning Double Edge. 
Since I still have that Chesto Berry equipped though, I can go ahead and heal off that damage with Rest, giving me an extra turn to nail an Earthquake for the KO. Fourth is her own Whiskash, so I went for Earthquake, doing under half as she hits Bulldoze, slowing down my own Whiskash and forcing me to swap into Pelipper, expecting another. This is fine though, as a Rain Boosted Critical Surf finishes off her Whiskash, leaving just Hip Out on. It replaces the Rain with the Sandstorm, making Surf not a one-shot anymore, but I really can't complain as Surf brings her into the red. Crunch barely does anything, and a second Surf wins me the match. Two down, three to go, no death so far. After a quick healing job though, it's time to assess the movesets and held items again, and going into Flint, I don't think I have to swap around much aside from giving Gastronon a Chesto Berry since Rapidash has Hypnosis, and I'm not about to lose to that. Sure enough, Flint leads with Rapidash's Hypnosis, but it misses, so no worries. I KO with Surf, leading to Low Punny. I figured Ice Beam would be the safest thing to go for here, doing respectable damage, but he fires back with Mirror Coat, doing just under half to Gastrodon. Thankfully, I can just swap between Ice Beam and Recover, and thanks to him missing a few high jump kicks, this rabbit's just found its final hunter, going down and leading into Steelix. Ugh, the more I play this, the more I miss the dignity that Platinum gave to Sinnoh with Fire Pokemon. Steelix is an easy KO with Surf, since it doesn't have Sturdy, leading to Drift Blim. It goes down to two Ice Beams after burning with Will-O-Wisp and attempting the classic Minimize Please O Lord Don't Die strategy, which fails like it did for Barry with Double Team. Last out is Infernape, so I swap out of Gastrodon into Empoleon on the turn he Mega Evolves, going for my own Mega Evolution as... Oh, right, wrong timeline. Seriously though, shoutouts to Millennium Loops and their team for making that in Unity a same game engine that BDSP were made in. Really hope someone makes it a full-fledged Oras-style remake of Diamond and Pearl one day, but we're probably far from that. Anyway, I actually swapped into Whizcash, taking it close combat twice and dealing out a waterfall and running into another Focus Sash for my troubles. Well, this isn't good for me. Close combat's still pretty deadly and he's rocking Thunder Punch. So I go into Tentacruel expecting another close combat or a fire type move, but he uses a full restore, following up with Thunder Punch for around 80% damage as a single surf is able to take him down, winning me the third match. Two more, no deaths, I'm feeling relatively optimistic. Lucian's where things start getting really difficult though, as my team's only one level over his ace Bronzong and he's a Trick Room user, so I've got to be pretty careful here. Also, I decided to turn on battle animations for these last two fights. Do you guys like battle animations being on for important fights, or do you not care? Leave a comment down below letting me know, and I'll try to do whatever's more requested from now on. Anyway, my strategy was to give Empoleon Rest and Brick Break over Surf and Metal Claw, giving me a way to out-duel screens from Mr. Mime, while also giving me a way to heal after setting up three Swords Dance. And since I'm also using a Held Chesto Berry for this one, this strategy should go pretty well. And it does, seeing as Mr. Mime only has Psychic and Dazzling Gleam for attacking moves, and neither of which do tons of damage to a Steel type, nor do they manage to lower my special defense. So I'm able to run through the screens with multiple Brick Breaks until he finally decides to swap, going into Alakazam to absorb a plus six Brick Break. It still goes into the red though, so he wastes a full restore as Drill Peck gets the KO, leading to Medicham. Empoleon outspeeds, nailing Drill Peck for the KO, as it also does on Girafferig, leading back into Mr. Mime. I figured I'd try to go for the Drill Peck KO, but he does go once again for Reflect, surviving on red HP, though that's probably more helpful than he uses his second full restore here instead of on Bronzong. I just kept wailing on it with Brick Break to force Reflect every turn, but eventually he did catch on, using two Psychics before going down, leaving just Bronzong. I went for Brick Break, expecting the neutral plus six to do enough, but it only does around 70%, letting him recover with a Citrus Berry and KO and pull on with an Earthquake, knocking me down to five members for Cynthia. Unfortunate to be sure, but Bronzong's in range for Gastrodon to put him down with two Surfs, surviving an Earthquake with over half HP to take him down and win the match. It probably would have been better if I had just swapped into either Pelipper expecting the Earthquake, or absorbing it with Gastronon instead of losing Empoleon, but this is the risk of not doing damage calculations. I don't like them because they make Pokemon unfun, but I know when they're needed and these last few battles are usually where. So now that I don't have Empoleon for Cynthia, what do I do? 
Well, loading up on Ice Beam for Roserade and Garchomp sounds pretty smart, and giving Gastron on Flash over Surf seems relatively useful so that I can prepare a Swords Dance sweep with Beaverell or an Elastich Effort Tentacruel, as Acid Armor and Sword Dance can be a fantastic bulk up S combo, and with Waterfall as my main move of choice, that should run through just about everything, though Cynthia's Gastrodon has Storm Drain, an ability that mine doesn't have, and makes it immune to Water-type attacks. So, giving it payback over Ice Beam in this instance that I have to use Tentacruel against Gastrodon seems like a pretty decent choice. Lastly, I gave Protect and Grass Knot to Barrel over Waterfall and Crunch. And in editing, this is where I realized my fatal mistake. Grass Knot is not a physical move. I don't know why I thought it was a physical move in the frickin' game, but I guess that's what happens when you start going into a panic since you lost your most vital Pokemon to a dumb mistake. But let's see if I can pull through it. Cynthia starts with Spiritomb, so I do the Yawn and Protect combo to put it to sleep, swapping for Gastrodon to get 6 flashes up, then swapping to Tentacruel once it got to low HP, then use a combo of Acid Armor and Swords Dance, getting 3 of each up and only taking a single Psychic before getting the one shot on Spiritomb with Waterfall, leading to Gastrodon. By the way, plus 6 Payback doesn't even do a third to Gastrodon, so she just keeps whittling me down with Rock Tomb, lowering my speed so that I don't have a chance against the rest of her team, but Tentacruel does manage to eventually take out the Gastrodon, leading to Milotic. Scald lands first, barely doing anything as Payback hits for half, but then her Flame Orb activates, triggering Marvel Scale and boosting her defense by 50%. A Flame Orb in the League? That's when I realized I totally underestimated the power of the League. Milotic smacked me down to the floor after using Recover, taking out Tentacruel with one more Scald. Though, of course, it burned me after it left me with one HP. Sad, but it's fine. I hope to get a cheeky KO with Bibero's Grass Knot, but she's not having any of that, swapping immediately into Lucario and threatening my Bibero. So I swap into Pelipper expecting an Aura Sphere, which does come out, doing around a third of Pelipper's HP. It's faster, so I don't even go for Air Slash, opting for the Rain Boosted Surf, bringing it down into the red as she does the same with Dragon Pulse. I sort of heal lock her as she uses a Full Restore, then I go for another Surf, getting her to use another Full Restore after pulling her back into the red, but turns out it was a range to get into the red, as a third Surf only takes Lucario into the yellow, with Pelipper going down next turn to a Dragon Pulse. I've got three Pokemon left to her four, one of which is burned and half dead, so probably three to three and a half. So going into Whizcash and... Uh, oh, you gotta be kidding me. How did I misclick Ice Beam? Oh, I've never botched so hard under pressure. But this is probably what leads me to the end. Despite Whizcash surviving another Aura Sphere and KOing with Earthquake, Roserade's able to come in, finish off Whizcash with Energy Ball, one-shot a barrel from full with Energy Ball, and deal the final blow to Gastrodon, finishing off my team 3-0. Well, this is embarrassing. I have just proven that I am unable to adapt to even a single death in the league, and my lack of knowledge on Grass Knot, as well as that misclick, definitely put me six feet under. Now, I'd try again, I would, but that run in of itself took nearly 28 hours to record, and I don't have nearly enough expendable time to do another run if I want to get this video out on release date. So, I ask you this. Would you like to see a part 2 with further attempts to beat this challenge, or would you like me to leave it as is and try other types as well as other games? Let me know in the comments below, and make sure to check out my Poison-type Hardcore Nuzlocke once again on Beast Coast Pokemon, link in the description. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Justin Dimenstein, Heimflow, Sean McKay, Alexander Abde, Andon Brandon, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Jacob Johnson, Kyle Campbell, and Zeno. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to support as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where you can get access to stuff like videos early, an exclusive role in my Discord server, link also in the description, challenge requests, and much more. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.